LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Um sie gehen die Fahnen und Standarten dieses Nationalsozialismus, wenn ihr Tuch einst morsch sein wird. Erst dann werden die Menschen ganz fähig sein, rückblickend die Größe unserer Zeit zu verstehen und zu begreifen, was sie, mein Führer, für Deutschland bedeutet. Sie sind Deutschland. Wenn Sie handeln, handelt die Nation. Wenn Sie richten, richtet das Volk. Unser Dank ist das Gelöbnis, in guten und in bösen Tagen zu Ihnen zu stehen. Komme, was da wolle. Dank Ihrer Führung wird Deutschland sein Ziel erreichen, Heimat zu sein. Heimat zu sein für alle Deutschen der Welt. Sie waren uns der Garant des Sieges. Sie sind uns der Garant des Friedens. Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and today we present part two of our interview with Thomas Sheridan in which we discuss his book, Volpurgis Night, Volume 1, 1919 to 1933. The interview resumes as we discuss Adolf Hitler's early life and how he developed an interest in the occult. Now, earlier you mentioned the sort of armed wing of the Thule Society, as it were. Perhaps we could just talk about Hitler as a cultist, how he got started with his interest in this area, and then also about a bit more about the Thule Society and his in- involvement. When he, when Hitler was a, a young man, he took an interest in a pamphlet called Ostara. It was actually a magazine. The magazine is quite an interesting magazine. You can get you can get some English translations online, and it was basically it was named Ostara after the German goddess of the of the spring. So it's based basically on the, the you know the Easter and Esther and all the other archetypes relating to springtime eggs fertility. It was produced by these individuals, including you know Lance van Liebensfeld, at the the order of the Templars compound, and Hitler went to visit him, as I said, at a very low point in his career, to complete his collection of the magazines which he had purchased both in Vienna and and in Munich, and he had been devouring devouring these magazines. They were a mixture of occult knowledge, some of it quite incredible like the use of uh, sex magic, fascination. That's when you use your eyes to hypnotize people because the belief was that the blood vessels in the eyes themselves were the easiest part to affect because if you could actually change the blood in in the eyes by staring at them, it would pump into the heart and you would get what you want. Two interesting, you know, interesting essays with titles such as Electronic God, 
using electronics as a means to uh, create kind of like supernatural gods that exist in the electronic world or, or the electromagnetic sp spectrum, as well as vicious anti-Semitic propaganda. So the combination of the two working together. Now, prior to that, Hitler had been in 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 Vienna and he had access to three libraries in the city which he was members of a member of all these top libraries and all the top libraries too would have had many of the texts from Rudolf II of Bohemia who was the, who was the alchemical emperor of of Bohemia and the Holy Roman Empire and they were all in these magical texts were all in Vienna as well as many other relics such as the, the spirit of destiny and other access to occult societies which were very very strong in Vienna when he was there he also had within his personal library which was recovered by the American 101 first airborne division and assault mine several books by leading occultists of the time such as Guido von Liszt personally addressed to Adolf Hitler uh, calling him his brother in Armament, which is the basically a German secret order. So there's incredible, there's incredible uh, anecdotal hard evidence that Hitler was heavily involved in the cult. He was in the right place, the right time, access to the right text. He was connected to the right people. He moved among them. But it was also, and this was for me was the most enjoyable part of this uh, this journey was going through and finding, you know, the, I'd say of all the books I, I read to research this, I'd say about only two of them dealt with uh, Hitler and the occult as such. The rest were basically historical biographies of people who were in the Third Reich. And Hitler, when he would be, even though he claimed to, you know, not have an interest in all this stuff when he came to power, people would, re had, would record conversations with him such as diplomats and other people. And they would say that he had a remarkable knowledge of things like the pineal gland and what the purpose of the pineal gland was and how it, it had been changed and how it should come back to be a kind of a another another sensory organ within the in the human in the human being. So Hitler absolutely one hundred percent had a, a vast for those days as well and very complex and dare I say it, sophisticated understanding of the occult. He was also very close to Rudolf Hess, who himself was very deeply entrenched, not only in the Thule Society, but also within French secret societies. Who also, And he was also living in Alexandria at the same time that Alistair Crowley was uh, summing, summing up his you know, Aeon of Horus. The connections are remarkable here. Hitler was surrounded by occultists. He was very much interested in himself in an occult society. And this is where he got his education in terms of controlling people. And this is this is this was a huge aspect of his personality and of the time, which is barely tackled at all in these books. In fact, until recently, in terms of an academic text, there's an author called David Lorenson. Who wrote a book called Hammer of the Gods, a very good book if you want to have a book to accompany uh, Valpurgis Night, The Thule Society and the Birth of Nazism. And he wrote this book initially as his dissertation for an academic paper, and he put it into a book and made it very readable. But oh, until that book came out, which I think is 2012 or 2011, other than kind of tabloidish kind of books on the Nazi occult, it would be barely mentioned. I have a volume of books on the, the Third Reich where the Thule Society is mentioned in the footnotes on one page. And yet this group basically invented Hitler, invented the Nazis, ran a sort of a magical paramilitary order out of the Four Seasons Hotel in Munich in 1919 and way beyond that. It was so important. It was so major. It would be like writing a history of the Reformation and not mentioning Martin Luther. That's how much historians did not want this stuff to get out. In fact, it was so much so that authors who wrote about Hitler in a magical sense after the war were actually getting death threats from the Israeli Jewish Sterngrang Zionist group 
they were they were told if you don't uh, if you write about Hitler, write about him in matter of fact terms. Do not make mention of his supernatural powers over people or his abilities to control the Germans. He was just a, a grubby dictator. This is how from day one, from literally from the moment the war ended, you could be shot by the Stern Gang for bringing up the supernatural aspects of the of the the Third Reich. So there's obviously more to that suppression than just ideas of magic and the occult being out of step with the you know technologically advanced and advancing uh, late 20th century um it, it couldn't be seen that uh, there was anything special or exceptional about some of the people at the top um of that regime well the, the, you have to understand that although we in this kind of like uh, post richard dawkins era we've been very much you know had science removed from spirituality in the early 20th century, in the late Victorian era, technology was seen as complementary to the supernatural world, to the occult. The development of radio, for instance, came directly out of spiritualism and this need to contact spirits. This is what drove radio. This is what drove some of the developments that led to the cathode ray tube, which gave us television. This is a, a this is a very interesting topic all by itself. But this was going on all over the world. Even cinema was actually looked upon as a way of maybe seeing, you know, spirits or contacting entities between the frames on the flicker rate as they went through the camera shutter. Rate everything, everything, even the development of Nazi technology during the war itself. This is why they covered their weapons in. In these magical symbols, these runes, these, these this is what they saw it as one as the same thing. There was no difference that these were not just you know weapons of war, but they were also you know weapons of witchcraft. And this would have not been seen as hysterical or weird or strange to them. It was just exact. It was just how the Nazis view things. Yeah, you're talking about the Nazi technology. Now that's a whole area unto itself. We could talk for hours just on that. But there were some remarkable advancements there, um, not just the V-series rockets, but there was energy devices, anti-gravity stuff. You sent me information about that, uh, was it Blom and Voss BV-141 plane? It's a Which medical look- design. Look at how exceptional the U-boats were. Um, look what the Nazis were up to in Norway with their heavy water factories. There was even plans for space stations. And then you look, think about what Werner von Braun went on to do with NASA. I mean, this was almost like a breakaway civilization in terms of tech. Oh, yeah. But it even, stu- it even before the war had begun, the National Socialists uh, had recruited an alchemist from France to actually make gold for them. And very successfully, the actual experiments were shown to be true. And suddenly the Nazis became very rich and... The the rumor was that they were getting money from international financiers. It could be true, but it's completely 100% confirmed that they were making gold through alchemical methods using what they call a white powder, the the origin of which has never been fully resolved. It was developed by a chemist in France who does – Basically, he was an alchemist who said by by manipulating atoms or what do you call them, like the actual – the actual building blocks of materials and moving them over through a kind of a weird alchemical mathematical process, he could generate gold. He was brought over to the Nazis. He gave a demonstration to them in a hotel where he was locked up and produced a large chunk of gold inside a, inside a, a vessel that they cracked open. And so this is the they, from day one they were very interested in all kinds of technology, even the technology to get into your mind. The, the aircraft they developed, they developed tanks that worked at electric turrets, something that was never, you know, thought of before. The Stuka dive bomber, for instance. I mean, that thing was designed to be like a witch coming, you know, a Valkyrie coming from the sky in a near vertical dive. And what happened was that thing, that thing, when that went into a near vertical dive, it had a siren, which they call Gabriel's trumpet. That was a psychological, a psychological uh, weapon that screamed this this terrifying sound as the Stuka bomber was coming down. Now, the Stuka bomber was designed in such a way that it had an autopilot system. It was basically worked on a clockwork electrical system because the pilot in the dive in within the dive always blacked out from the G-forces. But when he came through, the, the this, this Stuka dive bomber 
what we're talking about the 1930s now, would actually level off in flight, having successfully hit the target with the bomb, and he'd be, he'd be perfectly safe. This is this is incredible technology that was way ahead of anything else. And the reason for this is because the German scientists and munitions people were were operating with a completely different level of consciousness that other Western you know powers didn't have. They were basically told that now it had its dark side. It led to Mengele. It led to terrible human rights violations. It also led to things that went terribly wrong. But it had you know the, the Americans got a the Saturn V rocket into space, completely due to the Nazis and Werner von Braun. These people were developing complex uh, methods of propulsion. As you said, they were testing anti-gravity. They almost certainly built some kind of a uh, proto-UFO device, a hovering device that was that they, they they built. The details of which are very difficult to come by. There's only kind of scratchy hints that, sadly, you know, a lot of authors and writers have built an enormous case around but with the actual hardcore facts itself do give these tantalizing hints that the germans actually were developing incredible technology even the v weapons were incredible technology the v1 was basically a point and shoot airplane bomb but the v2 was a, a quantum leap in technology using a gyroscopic system to you know hit targets hundreds of miles away and that's basically still the the, the rocket that they use to this day even by nasa yes it's because they were freed up to be told again on this quest of this magical destiny with their witch king of the Teutonics, and it inspired in them new ways of thinking. I mean, they were developing synthetic rubbers that were, you know, the West didn't have. They were developing oil from coal and producing it in vast quantities. The only reason they attacked the Caucasus to get at the oil wells in the Soviet Union was because they just couldn't predict, they couldn't produce enough uh, synthetic oil, which is basically running their entire U-boat fleet, uh, because many of the factories had been bombed by the Allies. That they were they were doing technology that they, today that they tell us is impossible, and again because it was you know the dark side was driving this whole thing, but at the same time too because of there was no human rights I'm not saying that's a good thing I'm just saying this is what happens that like scientists who didn't have to worry about breaking laws or sticking by ethics could actually be allowed to go embark on flights of fancy and there seemed to be a very kind of a liberalist uh, policy within the third reich within national socialism to give them vast amounts of money to to test and work on these projects there was a tremendous freedom that was given to them like if they want if somebody said i have an idea for a submarine that can leave the ocean and fly and shoot down planes he would get you know he would get millions of deutschmarks once he presented a proper business case to go and develop this thing this kind of stuff the Allies, on the other hand, did none of this stuff. They were incredibly conservative. And it wasn't until the Americans entered the war that, and this was even at a late stage, that they were only through sheer numbers of Allied aircraft, Allied artillery, Allied mobilized divisions, that they were able to take on the Germans. And it's incredible, yet yeah, technologically, I mean, down to even how their grenades, their guns worked, it was just, it was just remarkable. They were... You know, they were literally in a league of their own. They were literally fight, living in they were they were 21st century army in the middle of the 20th century. Well, we know, of course, where if you listen to a Stuka siren, what that reminds us of, if we're talking about popular culture, it's uh, the Imperial Tie Fighters in Star Wars. We know George Lucas is a not perhaps to the extent of someone like James Cameron, but you know, as a guy with inside information, shall we say, most of us are not privy to. And of course, that was the whole idea of the the Imperial empire in star wars it was the nazis and we had we had it to a lesser extent for us provincial folks who remember it's what that's what the daleks are in doctor who yeah and even the star wars films where they talk about things like the force and this kind of thing there this idea that there's a an awareness that a battle is not only fought with on a, a technical materialistic level but the wars are also fought in a a consciousness non-material magical and supernatural level which ultimately is what brought down the the downfall of the nazis because the 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 british in particular started to understand these aspects and work around them and that's shown in the star wars film i mean 
Luke Skywalker, the last thing, you know, he goes with his intuition and uses the force to fire those rockets that eventually take out the Death Star. And that's George Lucas basically telling us that you could have all the, the technology, all the weaponry, all the military training, but there is a non-material aspect to the warrior that will create incredible things that will manifest for you or be destroyed for you and all this came directly out of the nazis the nazis encouraged this within not only within groups like the ss and even the wehrmacht but even within things like the, the right labor force who were armies of men who's and specifically chosen young men whose fathers had died in the first world war and so hitler and the national socialists became the kind of surrogate father and they were given they were given these uniforms that included a highly polished steel shovel and they would do like marches and routines. It's very, they're very well uh, displayed their techniques within the Lenny Riefenstahl film, the, the triumph of the will. But when, when they were, when they were digging in the, the Reich labor force, they were told that they were, you know, they were extracting the spirits of their dead father from the soil and to rebuild a new magical Germany. And in the Lenny Riefenstahl film, The, the Triumph of the Will, you have the, like, the Reich labor force mentioning the battlefields in which their father, their fathers all died, like Verdun, the Somme, the Danube, and so on, and uh, Passchendaele, and all these other horrific battles of World War I. And uh, it finishes with this young man in a kind of a messianic fever, with holding his, his shovel aloft, going you know you are not dead you are alive you are germany and this directly came again they were the nazis were phenomenal at tapping into the archetypal core of people in germany and their uniform had as an insignia of the oak acorn and two leaves growing and what they were saying was not only were they they were resurrecting the ghosts, the spirits of their dead fathers who died in the trenches of World War One, but it was a magical spell to extract them from the ground and bring them back to life. And this came also from a Germanic tradition of the oak men, which were men who were to guard the forests of Germany in you know, in relationship to their to their tribute to Dunar, which was the Teutonic uh aspect of thor the norway or and also uh indra which is in, in the vedic text this is very interesting how these archetypes are are consistent right across into the vedic world as well and the nazis were reinvigorating the, the oak men of ancient german society who protected the oaks because the oaks were seen as the living embodiment of germany and also the cathedrals of the german soul as well the gothic cathedrals look like forests at the same time resurrecting their fathers. This was typical of the magical spells that the that the Nazis used in order to get what they wanted. Another one was the when they had the nineteen thirty three sorry, the nineteen thirty two sorry, thirty three Nuremberg rallies, they invited the German military and Hitler and Goebbels and the rest of them put the the German officer class in the front row of a reviewing stand and showed them the new ways of warfare and everything moved everything was moving horses were pulling artillery there were tanks there was soldiers running they were on motorcycles they were being supported by is the blitzkrieg being supported by aerial uh, aerial support constant movement constant motion and the german high military command who were not nazis at that point or even interested particularly and many often many of them very suspicious of the nazis are spellbound by this motion and the reason was this blitzkrieg this fast lightning war was to undo the spell of the germans bogged down for four years in the trenches of the eastern and western front it was to undo that so this is this is all magic this is all sorcery this is all occultism to change people in conformity with the will of national socialism and they did it on an industrial and colossal level and with spectacular results in a very very short time well you talk about the nuremberg rally uh, i mean that was 1938 i believe and uh, that was just something to behold and of course you had the 1936 olympics that was another uh, significant event um, along those lines and 
in all of that, when you look at the historical footage of it, the, the symbolism is just so striking. You mentioned earlier about runes on weapons and on uniforms. Uh, the swastika, of course, has got, again, a whole interesting history to how that became the symbol um, of, you know, of the Reich. And there's the old joke that, you know, the Nazis won the fashion war. But, th- that, you know, none of that, as you say, was by accident. It was very, it was orchestrated. And the first, I mean, what is it even today when you get someone like uh, Prince Harry putting on a Nazi uniform, jokingly, ha, 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 for a fancy dress party? I mean, people, I bet when people do that, not something I would ever do, but I bet they feel something. I bet they feel different with those insignia and the weight that carries. Well, I remember when I was a Boy Scout, when I got my proficiency badges, there was a kind of a sense of a rush that came from winning a proficiency badge or a merit badge. Multiply that by a thousand, especially to a broken people, and you can see how incredible it must have felt for them. Their use of symbolism was tremendous. They they understood symbolism to a level that I, I only think... Today, even Hollywood, this is why Hollywood loved the Nazis and were, and were, and were fascinated by them. And even the, the Jewish leaders of uh, Hollywood studios like MGM were not bothered by the Nuremberg racial laws or any of the anti-Semitic stuff that was going on in Germany. They were so infatuated by the German use of symbolism, they wanted to bring them into Hollywood movies. That's why the Germans were the, the giant studio outside uh, Berlin. They were phenomenal at making films and, and all kinds of genres that really, really could control people. And Hollywood is deeply impressed by this. But like we hear Lenny Riefenstahl, but she was just one of many who were doing this, mainly because she was the one who were most associated with the with the Third Reich. But if you watch the, the Triumph of the Will, it tells you everything you need to know. It begins with Hitler flying in a, in a plane to the rallies, so he's arriving. This came out of a, a campaign that was run in 1932 called Hitler over Germany, where while other camp, other politicians who were looking to win the elections were arriving late by train or driving by car, Hitler in a in a in a customized aircraft could fly in and land in a field in anywhere from Bavaria to Saxony up to Prussia and meet with people in rural areas. And he would be, it was deliberately designed to see him come and arrive as a god on the silver plane coming from the sky. Again, tying in greatly with uh, Germanic uh, mythology. And so, you know, he would be in a, in, in a small town in, you know, Saxony. And he would meet the people, you know, give it an amazing speech and be gone while the other candidates for the other parties were still arriving by train. Or by car, he was the master of public relations. Well, the people around them were the masters of public, but not just Goebbels. There was lots of people. He had lots of these people around him who understood this stuff, and that w- that starts off the triumph of the will. It flies in through the clouds, and then you see this, the beautiful city of Nuremberg appearing below, and there's a very significant shot where it begins where it shows a cathedral spire in the city center and then the camera moves slowly from the city's uh, church spire and all the spires of the the city and away from them and down towards the banners and flags of national socialism it's symbolically saying to the people who are watching it this was your old god the christian god here are your new gods. And then what you have for the next 80 minutes or so is something that even today is, is an amazing thing to behold. It's almost like a musical meets, meets political rally. Even the part at, during the Congress where they're having the names of the ministers announced, they're, you can, it's hard to believe this is 1932 or 1933 whenever the, or 34 when the film is released. The way the names fly out of the screen as Rudolf Hess announces them, and each member of uh, the party and the cabinet give their little address for the year, and then it switches to what I was talking about earlier on, the, the Reich Labour Service, which is almost like a musical number they perform with their shovels. It shows the, the Hitler youth again 
they've they, it is very cult like they're no longer really their parents sons anymore they're now the sons of adolf hitler and it just it just it's a film that this day is amazing to behold now could you only imagine what that was like at the time now we're talking about a germany that not too long before that was in absolute ruins and humiliation and some of the way the symbolism is done at these rallies is incredible for instance they would have parades of of uh, brown shorts carrying uh, swastikas banners and they would form a a converging circle very very pagan very celticish and coming to meet in the center underneath the podium where hitler would speak surrounding all the other delegates at the conference in a very symbolic magical ritual type of way hitler would not come out on time he had hired the best people from the top audio companies in germany to develop tones and pitches that would be played at the rallies before he came along you know this is incredible stuff when you start thinking about it. we're talking about the 1930s people would hear when well, you wouldn't hear the tone it would be at below their hearing level down around 40 hertz 30 hertz maybe maybe kids and teenagers might hear it it would cause agitation it would cause a sense of being and they would get annoyed and annoyed where where is the fuhrer where is the chancellor where is he what when is hitler going to come and then right before he came on stage he would pause and not talk and in that moment that between the him pausing on the stage and saying nothing these audio tones were switched off slowly so a sense of relief came about in the crowd that when hitler stood up and walked towards the microphone and they used the best sound systems of the time the best lighting systems you name it it was top of top of the line technology again keeping what i was saying earlier on that the nazis technology and magic were the same thing there was no there was no uh conflict between both i both ideas being applicable in the same context and the audience would just be launched into a state of euphoria now he would use his theatrical training to do things like push back his hair to hold his hands together and plead with the audience it would be a crescendo it would be a polemic saying that every problem that you have was caused by an enemy. It's not your fault. What happened in the war It was a terrible punishment for a crime you never committed. It would build and it would build and it would build into this incredible finish where he would literally have the crowd so captivated and so spellbound. And again, everyone, even the people that have 200,000 people at these rallies, the sound systems are so good. They even invented delayed sound systems where you had a sort of a, an electronic relay that just to compensate for the distance of sound traveling, the speed of sound travels at 550 meters per second. So the people at the back, so they did not get an echo. The relay systems on the audio amplifiers in the towers would click on in accordance with the speed of sound. So the person at the back of the hall heard this, the, the audio with no echo, not the back of the hall, the back of the stadium, would hear the audio without the echo as clear as the person at the very front. By the time it was over, you would have 200,000 people completely and utter, utterly under the control of this one man from Austria who was standing there on the stage using all this technology, using all this theatrics, and basically being like, what they wanted, the Freya Christus who would deliver them to the promised land, the salvation of the German soul. You mentioning sound techniques, again, you cover in the book a rather interesting section to do with the music of Wagner and the staging of his operas. Uh, so you can trace what you're talking about, in, in part at least, back to, to then. That's directly where I came from. Hitler when was quite a good artist. That's another myth that has to be undone, that Hitler was a shit artist. Hitler was a very competent artist. And he wanted to get a job in the Royal Beyond, in the Royal Opera in Vienna, or any other city, doing, say, stage sets for Wagner. This is from a very early age, because he understood the hypnotic power of the lighting. Even Nazi ministers were given their own theme tune. Just like in Wagner operas, Wagner developed the idea that when a certain character entered the stage, 
they had their own theme tune. Hollywood picked this up. Wagner was doing this back in the 1870s. Hitler then applied that to his own ministers. So if you had an event where, say, Goebbels walked in, he had his own Goebbels tune. This is incredible stuff. Hitler was fully aware that Wagner was a tremendous musician. And that's why Hitler said, there is no other predecessor to me. I'm totally, you know, the protege of Wagner. Again, we're back to the whole thing of the art created the reality. Yeah, one other little aspect that interested me, and uh, I know this is not a major part of it, but it is to do with the symbolism and the magical element of this, was the, the names that they gave to some of their machinery. And, like, for example, the, the tanks, Tiger, Panther, Panzer, and it's all very thrusting and aggressive and to do with power. And it just this is just a little thought of my own. As a lifelong fan of German cars, um, with the exception of maybe Porsche, you don't get German cars with kind of racy, you know, thrusting names anymore. Volkswagen tend to give their cars names, but BMW, Audi, those big global brands are just um, benchmark for quality. They're always given numbers. It's, you know, it's six and seven series and, you know, A3 and A4. And it's very, very functional, very mundane. And I know from, you know, I've been to Germany many times over the years, you know, through various bits of work that I've done and, German people that I know, there's almost like a a reticence to, because of what happened in the past, to go out there and just, you know, say, you know, we're having this, we're taking this, we're the best at this, we won the prize, and they've just won the World Cup. But, you know, there's always this kind of, this has lived on uh, in German consciousness, the events of those years ever since. And I don't know if you sense any of that kind of reticence along the lines of kind of like oh yeah we know we're good at this but you know don't blow out of proportion we're not trying to make any big claims here well the, it's funny you mention that about the german cars being in numbers because i actually think the reason they picked those weapons like leopard and pan what well, panzer means armor but leopard and tiger and all these other names and even v might be interesting because it may allude to the vril society which is actually a book called not, the uh, Vrilia, the coming of the map, the super, the future super race, or something like that, that was written in the 1870s, a science fiction novel that actually inspired the growth of nationalism. The idea that blood had a magical force, and there was there was this angelic race of beings that lived in the center of the earth, and when Aryan blood reached this kind of like, almost like a state of perfection, this is why they're obsessed with blood. This Vrilia race would return to earth and give the Germans, the Aryans, superpowers. The Germans and the the Germans are a very interesting people. We have this functional idea. You mentioned the cars and the series and numbers and so on. But they also have a deep tradition. That's a very modern idea of the German developed after Bismarck and particularly the, the Prussian education model that created the kind of like stereotypical German we know today. But the German is also a very romantic soul. And it was almost like a repre- the, the, the Nazis deliberately oppressed that romantic soul. So when they gave weapons names like t- Tiger and Leopard, and, on the, and these other names they gave to their tanks and their, all their other, lots of their other things have these kinds of names. They, and even the, the siren on the Stuka, they were invoking deep rooted archetypes regarding sort of the, the folklore of Germany. So the, you know, in, in the Teutonic world, they would dress in animal skins, very much like the shaman of Siberia. And that would give people magical powers. It would allow them to uh, communicate with other beings that lived in the mountains of Germany. It would allow them to visit the witch kings. And a lot of this also came from Finnish magic. Finnish uh, occult and magic was very influential in Germany right, right up until the 16th and 17th century. So you give them, on one hand, this kind of a technical thing, but then on the other hand, you supply them with magic. You supply them with ideas of of liberation. For instance, you know, people think the whole idea of the car is the American dream. I've got a book that I was reading by uh, David Welch called The Third Reich Propaganda and Politics, and he has posters for Volkswagen from the 19, 1934, and it shows the exact model that the Americans would then later adopt for the American dream. There's a Volkswagen with an open top, a pretty girl with a hand in the air having a symbol of freedom, and the young guy driving the car knowing he's going to get that girl tonight. The Nazis developed all this. The Nazis played on a lot of the archetypes that Bernays brought to the United States, but 
This didn't mean that when Bernays went to the US, no one else was doing it. The Nazis had paid careful attention of human psychology as well and also applied it to basically the corporate model of national socialism, which was basically corporations such as Volkswagen, such as Krupps, such as IG Farben, who were intrinsically seen as sort of co co kind of like magician sorcerers, scientists in league with this destiny that Germany was moving towards. It was like nothing like in history had ever been done like this before. And it's been repeated in, in, in ever since, particularly in the United States. But it was all gestated and began within Germany under the Nazis. You mentioned the book Viril, The Power of the Coming Race. So that was 1871 by Edward Bulwer and Lytton. I think that's a bit of a mouthful, yeah. as the names tended to be back then. I've just picked up a copy of that. I've not read it yet, but I must admit, as soon as I looked at that, that you cited it, I just looked at Viril and my mind said Viril. Yeah. And of course, that's an interesting story to how you know, fantasy and reality overlapping. And I've, I've, I've sort of thumbed through the book and it seems very simple, you know, very simplistic, almost insubstantial, maybe not in terms of ideas, but, you know, that some of the chapters are one page long. And yet it had this enormous uh, ca- you know, captured a lot of people's imaginations back at that time, and you had all sorts of people, um, including Rudolf Steiner, for example, some of the theosophists. Uh, I'm actually quite a fan of some of Steiner's ideas. You know, when it comes to permaculture and what have you, that that they got captured by this idea that um, this race, proto master race, living inside the Earth, could actually have some degree of reality to it. But of course, that also overlaps into the technology inside mountains you know the subterranean installations that the nazis were fans of and v weapons were built inside mountains which is that's you know playing on that archetype again the book was so influential the real book that both blavatsky and steiner were convinced it was it was true they said the book is so convincing it cannot possibly be a fiction that this has to be a real a real reality it was incredible. It was a classic example of science. The first, probably the first ever example of science fiction using to future-proof people's uh, people's psychology going forward. Both Steiner and Blavatsky were convinced that the book was, which, as you said, is a very simple about a, a young guy who stumbles accidentally into this hole in the earth and finds this kind of race of angelic Aryan beings of light who, you know, are based on, you know, on Aryan blood. Very, very simple ideas, but yet it, it, it captivated you know, people like Steiner, which is quite an intelligent, well-read man, to the level it did. It can only imagine the effect it had on people. It was a sensation, that book at the time. It sold in, in, in millions of quantities and, and was read by vast numbers of people all across different strata of society, not just in Germany. Well, Thomas, we're sort of gradually drawing to a close for today, but it's just a couple more little points I want to throw in. I almost didn't know where to put these earlier, but you mentioned Hitler's um, concern, shall we say, I won't say obsession, but concern with the moon and the, the power of, of, of that. Now, that's you know something that's endlessly fascinating for me in general. I've read all sorts of theories about the moon, um, you know, how it got where it is, what it's made of, is it artificial, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, it has a palpable effect that nobody will deny on the tides in the earth and therefore in our bodies. Um, but what do you think, was it uh, Hitler's idea about this or his interest? Was that stemmed by some materials that he read, perhaps in his occult studies? There's a book called The Psychopathic God by Adolf Hitler by Robert G. L. Waite, which is a, a very good psych, uh, a psychological profile of Adolf Hitler based on all kinds of obscure statements and speeches that he made. Many of them had never been previously printed in the in in many of the, the mainstream texts. And he was using these sort of like offbeat statements by Adolf Hitler to to point out various things. One of the strangest ones was this comment he made to his beloved Rudy, his dear Rudy, Rudolf Hess, who I believe is one of and which I'll elaborate in future volumes of this book was one of the most powerful people of the 20th century. The full moon was 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 outside the prison cell at Landsberg, and Hitler said that he, he called the moon that nasty fellow, that cold, pale fellow, that he believed, again, showing his occult uh, knowledge, 
that the moon played, a, there was something in the moon that played a role in human destiny. That this, uh, this force or this energy inside the moon, which you've heard a lot about in recent times, from everybody from David Icke to several other people, that there's something in the moon. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but Hitler had a genuine phobia about the moon. He did not like the moon. And he believed that there was a force in the moon that played a role in human behavior and human destiny. And not a passive role, a very much an active role. And he mentioned this to Rudolf, uh, Rudolf Hess in the prison cell. Now, what he meant by that, it's a shame because we'll never know because that was all that was ever recorded. It is probably one of the most interesting aspects of Hitler's uh, psychology, if not pathology, that's that's ever been revealed a lot, and this and uh, weight basically sh says that it's just proof that Hitler was a lunatic. Again, unfortunately, the psychopathic God Adolf Hitler is a rather much a polemic again, because he's a he's an academic, but he just says that it's the typical lunatic, the fear of the moon. But I believe it was something much deeper. It may have represented the feminine aspect of the the unresolved feminine aspect of National Socialism. There really wasn't much place for women within National Socialism except for breeding. And even though Hitler was a ladies' man, which I was very surprised to find out, he basically ha he basically could have any woman he wanted from the starlets in the German cinema scene. But Again, women were seen very much almost like within National Socialism as kind of like uh, domestic servants. They were there just to support the men to have the children. We saw that with the Lebensborn movement where, you know, the best Aryan women were selected to have babies by young SS recruits and Hitler youth. And he's, you know, I speculate there may have been a feminine aspect. I think this fear of the moon is rooted in some kind of rejection of feminine energy. This is just my theory, and I think Hitler's Hitler's problem with the moon may have been a result of his own relationship with his mother, and a kind of a subconscious desire to live in fear of feminine energy, the power of feminine energy. That's just my theory. I think it's something that I wish we had more insight on, and it's definitely one of the most intriguing remarks that Adolf Hitler ever made considering it was happening at the time Mein Kampf was being written which was an enormous when it's an enormous grimoire of basically you know it's a magical treatise delivered towards the German subconscious it was co-written with Rudolf Hess a major occultist and it was also edited by a Jesuit priest the first the initial editing was with a Jesuit priest so what was going on in that prison the close confinement of Hess and Hitler being in a cell together nearly 24 hours a day, basically planning the future of the world and to an incredible degree delivering it, must have been infused with an incredible sense of the magic, the supernatural. And Hitler's comment about the moon, you know, definitely points to that, that they were definitely involved in a very kind of a magical, supernatural atmosphere within the prism. And Will we ever know what he really meant by that? I don't know, but it's. I think there's a. There's definitely something in that that is very revealing of this mystery, and I do hope in time I, I find out more, and you know I do get you know to, to to dig deeper into that mystery. I would like to actually find out more of the statements and the conversations that were recorded inside the prison with Rudolf Hess. But it is. It's a remarkable statement, especially in the very poetic an almost lyrical way in which Hitler, uh, Hitler, you know, outlines his terror of this unknown and mysterious active force in the moon. One final little thought. The name Jesus or Jesus is not uncommon in certain parts of the world these days. It's not seen as blasphemous or heretical or inappropriate. Um, and, you know, a young boy growing up with that name might feel quite good about it, really, you know, given it's in their culture, certainly positive um, connotations. And the name Hitler has vanished, it seems, forever. I mean, are there other Hitlers in the German phone book? I don't know. I don't think so. Adolf isn't the most popular boy's name in Germany or anywhere else. People sometimes grow Hitler-type moustaches, but they tend to be well aware of what they're doing, the same as people who go around 
tattooing swastikas on their foreheads. It's just interesting how, given we talk so much about magical connotations and about the power of names and yeah. archetypes, that what that means for something as mundane as somebody's Christian name, <laughs> pardon the <laughs> use of the word Christian, or or surname, and yet there was something there that meant that having the surname Hitler after 1945 was going to raise some eyebrows. And the swastika too. Oh, the swastika has been around forever. I have a picture of carved swastikas on the wall of a Jewish synagogue from the first century in Palestine. It's everywhere. It's uh, it's it's all over the world, and you had situations as late as the nineteen late nineteen eighties, where the the band Cooler Shaker had to make a public apology on MTV for having swastikas on their Hindu inspired album cover, or I think it was a single, twelve inch single, whatever. The singer from that band had to go on MTV and apologize for having a perfectly harmless and innocuous Vedic symbol of the sun simply because that symbol to this day has so much power and that's what's so interesting about it that people say we you know that the people who are saying you know there is no magic to the, the third reich there was no occultism are telling you to reject the swastika which is showing that the magic still exists to this day that force and that power still exists in in Galway, near here, a few years ago, a couple of hippie kids, uh, a group of hippie kids, set up a Take Back the Sw Swastika Arts Festival where they wanted to paint swastikas and, and show how this, the, the symbol is not to do with Nazis. And local members of the, the, the Cultural Marxist Student League were instantly calling them Nazis. And this is disgraceful because these kids were doing nothing of the source. But the power of that that this day, that, that that black magic has still gone on. The fact you can destroy someone's career by saying if he's in Hollywood or he's an author or he's... I mean, look at David Irvin, the, the historian. I've read most of his books, and he's portrayed as a Nazi fanboy. To an, to an, to an extent there is there, but it's not rooted in hatred of Jews or anything else like that. And he openly talks about the horrors and tragedies of the Holocaust and the injustice of the, the Nuremberg uh, racial laws. But just because Irvin has tried to readdress the astounding polemics in mainstream history and mainstream academic regarding the Nazis, he's vilified as a Nazi himself, which, you know, OK, he does scare close to some dodgy uh, things at times. But the reality is he this is what happens with historians. They often decide to take a less than neutral approach to something all he just he, basically what he was doing was trying to readdress the 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 inconsistencies in how history was taught regarding that period which i've tried to do myself but in a very very different way even people who bought my book said that because the, the paintings i've done for the cover and the back got them very strange looks on the train station or at work to this day that magic works. And if you don't believe that the Nazis were a supernatural empire and the Third Reich was built on sorcery, then you're not paying enough attention because the hexan, the magic and the power still exist to this day. And that's why we have a fear of, of the swastika. And that's why people won't name their children Adolf. And that's proof positive that magic is real. It does exist. And it's how the world is. And that's just that was the whole purpose behind Valpurgis Night Volume One, and I hope to take this further with the next two volumes. And it will, what it, I was really revealing to myself was, although I was writing the supernatural history of the Third Reich in the context of a psychological, psychosocial examination of the subject, what I really discovered was that I was writing the history of the world today because it's still going on, particularly among the American leadership from the Bushes with their Skull and Bone Society and all these other kind of like things like Bohemian Grove and all these other bizarre manifestation of the, the psychopathic control grid that we have today, that the sorcery and the magic still goes on. And we have to go back, see what was done to us in the past so we can 
learn not to fall in these traps in the future because ultimately the the story of national socialism and the supernatural empire of the third reich is one of absolute horror that as i said the black magic ultimately spooled back and fed on the german people themselves who at the end of 1945 had probably suffered worse than anyone Excellent. Well, Thomas, once again, we've been talking about your book, um, Volpurgis Night. Perhaps I should have been saying not Walpurgis Night, as I said at the top of the hour. Yeah, Volume 1, 1919 to 1933. Tell folks about where they can get that, your website. And of course, uh, you've got information on there about the other books you've got out. They go to my website, thomasheridanarts.com. You'll see a little link at the top saying bookshop. And you can get Valpurgis Night and Anvil of the Psyche there. You can also get it on Amazon.com if you're in the United States who are giving a very good discount. If you buy all three of my books together, you get quite a hefty savings. So I might be, if you want to get my other books there, that's probably the way to do that. But the, the best link for it right now is the, the, the direct one from the website, thomasheridanarts.com. And people are like getting it in a few days all over the world. So the, 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 the distribution is, is I'm delighted with it, how it's been working out. So that's Valpurgis Night Volume 1. And if you wanted to check out my other book, The Anvil of the Psyche, that kind of is a good addendum to it because it kind of brings the story up to date in terms of culture. Excellent. Well, Thomas, thank you so much for spending time with us again on LegalizeFreedom.com. Thank you very much, Greg, and uh, thanks again for letting me be your 100th guest. I feel very honoured. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, folks, that's it for another week. As ever, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoy the show, please check out the website. That's LegalizeFreedom.com, Legalize-Freedom.com, where you'll find an archive of programmes offering alternative views on a wide range of topics, including world affairs, politics and economics, science and technology, religion and spirituality, conspiracy and alternative history. You can also browse and buy a range of books and DVDs from our guests and if you're feeling generous, make a donation to help keep the site up and running. Until next time, I'm Greg Moffat and you've been listening to LegalizeFreedom.com.